Hey, welcome to class 11. We're going to be talking about sedimentary rocks today. And these are important for a couple reasons. Uh, one, they are uh, how coal, oil, and gas get deposited and formed. So this will kind of be our introductory lecture into talking about coal, oil, and gas in the coming weeks. But also, they're really important in their own right. Sedimentary rocks are deposited on the surface of Earth usually in water, and they record the entirety of Earth history. So this is where we get things like fossils, this is how we know about evolution, and really this is how we know about most of Earth's history. So they're incredibly important, incredibly cool, and rich topic. So as I just said, sedimentary rocks are deposited on the surface, and that's pretty broad. That means a lot of different places. So anywhere there's water, you can certainly get them a lake, a beach, um, the deep ocean, of course, but then also a bunch of places outside of water, like sand dunes, um, alluvial fans, uh, glacial deposits, swamps. So any place you can lay down sediment and then bury it with additional sediment is a place that you could potentially make a sedimentary rock. And what's cool is because of that, they record the conditions of Earth's surface and also of Earth's oceans over time. So they have this incredible record of, of Earth history. And it's cool to motivate this by thinking about what's going on on Mars right now. The Curiosity rover is exploring the surface of Mars. And the reason it landed where it did uh, here in Gale Crater is because it wanted to explore this mountain called Mount Sharp, which is literally a stack of sedimentary rocks that have accumulated in this crater. And the idea is that these sedimentary rocks are going to record the changing conditions of the Martian surface over time. And we might learn something about how Mars has evolved. So here's a look at some of the sedimentary layers on Mount Sharp. And currently, the Curiosity rover is basically driving up through these layers and analyzing the chemistry of these different layers to try to figure out what happened on Mars over time. And it's making a lot of the same observations we'll, we'll discuss in this lecture. Of course, back on Earth, an awesome motivation for sedimentary rocks would be someplace like the Grand Canyon. Um, what you're seeing in this picture is layers of sedimentary rocks on Earth which of course represent um, older time at the bottom, and then they've piled up such that the younger time is represented by rocks on the top. So there's a whole record of Earth history buried in these rocks here. That includes things like um, ancient sand dunes that record ancient deserts, um, also things like ancient forests, a lot of petrified wood um, that records you know, forested surface conditions, and even things like dinosaur tracks um, in mud. So this crazy record of all these awesome things in the sediments from the Grand Canyon. So in this lecture, uh, I'll first introduce the two classes of sedimentary rocks. Then we'll talk about the properties of clastic sedimentary rocks. Then we'll talk about this idea of sedimentary facies or environments. And then we'll talk about biogenic sedimentary rocks. So there's two main types of sedimentary rocks. Uh, these are called clastic and biogenic. Clastic rocks are made of minerals or reworked rock particles. So that would be a thing like a sandstone, something you might typically see in a riverbed or on a beach. Biogenic is another class of sedimentary rock that's unique because it's composed almost entirely of dead organisms. And these are usually uh, the shells of organisms that are made from a unique uh, molecule, calcium carbonate or calcite. So usually biogenic rocks are made of shells, and usually those shells are made of calcite. And an example of that would be limestone. So these are quite different. You can basically grow a biogenic rock and pile it up in place, but a clastic rock you need to actually deposit reworked rocks. Now the next 
bunch of slides are basically dedicated towards learning how we can interpret the depositional environment of different sedimentary rocks. So for example, I could look at this and right away tell you these are sand dunes. They're deposits from ancient sand dunes. And so our goal here is to really learn how geologists interpret the environment of sedimentary rocks. Why is this important? Well, for one, we're going to be able to learn about ancient environments on Earth history, but also maybe find oil or gas or, or other things. All right, so let's look at some of these properties that help us interpret sedimentary rocks. The first one is grain size. So this is the size of the clastic particles. And the basic idea is that um, grain size records the maximum energy of the environment. Because when you're thinking about water, it takes a higher energy stream of water to move larger particles. And likewise, those large particles can settle out first in fast water. So if we find fast, if we find large particles, like for example, 10 millimeter particles, it would mean that they were, you had to have a certain velocity of water to transport them there, okay? And also that they would have settled out at a certain velocity. In contrast, if you find tiny particles like clay, they could have been transported there by any velocity of water, but in order to drop out or to settle down to the bottom, those particles would need to be, uh, excuse me, the velocity of the water would need to be extremely, extremely low. So in summary, large particles mean fast moving water, small particles mean calm water. And it turns out that many clastic sedimentary rocks are actually named for their grain size. So when we talk about gravel, we're referring to something that's made of pebbles and cobbles, which are up in the inch to several inches range. When we talk about a sandstone, we're talking about something that's made of sand, which is defined as particles between uh, 0.06 and 2 millimeters. We talk about a silt stone, we're talking about a sedimentary rock made of silt, and that would be between 004 and 062 millimeters. So here we're getting very, very tiny. Silt is something you could, you can see it, but not by a lot. And if we're talking about a shale, that's usually made of clay, which is even smaller, down to basically one micron grain size, basically invisible to the naked eye. And these particles are so tiny that they have to be in absolutely calm, dead still water in order for them to settle. Any kind of energy in the water would keep a clay particle suspended. So a second property of clastic rocks is called sorting. So this would be the distribution of grain sizes in a rock. So poorly sorted would denote uh, a mixture of very large particles with very small particles. Whereas in a well-sorted rock, all of the particles would be the same size. So if we have a well-sorted rock, it usually reflects that there was a very narrow range of velocities or energies in which the sediments were deposited. Because we know the water energy had to be energetic enough to bring this particular size there and deposit it, but it also had to be energetic enough to uh, take away anything that was smaller than this. So it really denotes a very specific range of energies if it's a well-sorted rock. In contrast, if it's a poorly sorted rock, it often means there was a wide range of velocities or it was a very turbulent system in which a bunch of different sizes were delivered and were able to settle out at the same time. So let's have a look at this. An example of a well-sorted deposit would be a beach sand. Notice these cobbles here are all almost exactly the same size. And that's because the wave action that brought them there had a very specific energy range. It was energetic enough to bring them up to the beach, but, but of course didn't bring anything bigger. Um, and, it was, and it took everything else away and washed it back out to sea, only leaving behind the stuff that was just big enough to settle 
in this particular location. In contrast, uh, glacial till is another type of sediment, and it's an example of a very poorly sorted sediment. Um, so glacial till is the debris that's pushed up along the edges of a glacier as the glacier advances down a valley. And if you look at what glacial till looks like, it's super poorly sorted. You've got really big boulders here mixed in with some incredibly fine-grained material here. So what this tells us is that, well, the reason it's this way is because there's no water at all in this system. This is just like a bulldozer pile. And so because there was no water involved, there was nothing involved, no energy to take away this finer grained material. Um, so all that finer grained material is still there. It wasn't washed away by the water currents and thus we're left with a poorly sorted deposit. So the third property of clastic rocks is rounding, uh, rounding of the sediment grains. And we can think of rounding as really recording the duration of energetic transport. Uh, as sediment grains get worked over by waves or river water, they grind against each other and become rounded. And so the longer they're in an, ener an energetic transport system, the more rounded they become. Okay, so here's an illustration from angular up to rounded. And then here's what this might look like in real life. Here's some angular quartz grains. And then here's some really beautifully rounded quartz grains. So these rounded ones have probably sat on a beach for thousands of years being washed back and forth by that wave energy. Whereas these might be just freshly derived from a crushed rock. Okay, so that wraps up the three properties of clastic rocks, grain size, rounding, and sorting. So now let's take a look at sedimentary environments, or what we call sedimentary facies. And uh, sedimentary environments, or facies, are mostly determined by the water depth and the corresponding energy of the water, and also uh, by the sediment supply. And mostly now we're going to be considering environments in the ocean as opposed to lakes or rivers. So there's three main facies that we could consider. That's a sandstone facies, a shale facies, and a limestone facies. And the sandstone one is, is near shore. This is a place where wave energy deposits a lot of coarse sand and gravel. Okay. The shale facies is deeper water. Basically, the water is deeper, it's calmer, and that allows clay and silt particles to settle, giving us a shale rock, which is much finer grained. And then we've got this limestone facies. This is often also called the abyssal facies. And this is so far from shore that basically there's no clastic sediment available. That sediment was delivered by rivers, and the coarse stuff settles out right away, the finer clays settle out further from shore, but by the time you get to an abyssal distance, there's literally no sediment supply. And so sedimentation rates are very low, and the sediment is mostly made up of dead organisms and their shells. So that's going to be a biogenic rock. It's going to be limestone. So we're making that biogenic rock because there's no clastic sediment available out there. Now the mineralogy also changes in each of these facies. The sandstone facies tends to feature mostly strong minerals like quartz and feldspar. These are minerals that can survive being worked around on the beach for thousands of years, okay? And they don't break down into smaller particles. So beaches tend to be rich in quartz and feldspar. Now shale, on the other hand, tends to feature weak minerals like micas, or clays. So micas would be like biotite and muscovite. These are minerals that can get quickly broken apart into small particles and flushed offshore where they settle. And that's very different than, than the sandstone facies. Out here in the limestone facies, we have mostly carbonate minerals. These are the, dead, the shells of dead organisms that died and sank to the bottom. So these aren't even clastics at all. 
So really different mineralogies in these different zones. So what specifically controls the energy levels of these different facies? One way to look at this is the concept of wave base. And the way this works is that as waves roll in off the ocean, they actually make an oscillating motion in the water that isn't just at the surface. That oscillation actually extends to depth and actually uh, causes disturbances on the ocean. So the result is that if you're at a depth that's shallow enough to be uh, above the wave base, then the sediment interface is going to constantly be disturbed and you're going to be moving sediment around uh, and you're going to be depositing only coarser particles in this case maybe silt or sand if you're below wave base if you're below the level of disturbance then you're well into the shale facies you're into this area where there's no energy at all and even the tiniest clay particles can settle out now another factor in determining facies is sediment supply and this is mostly controlled by rivers. And let's just look at a couple examples. So here's a picture of the, Chil the North Chilean coast. This is the Atacama region. It's a desert. And there's very few active rivers delivering sediment in here. So there's basically no sediment supply to this part of the coast. Contrast that with the mouth of the Amazon River, this huge tropical river that is incredibly choked with muddy sediment and is actually delivering that sediment into the ocean. And then you can see the areas along shore are also really, really muddy because that mud doesn't settle right away. It gets worked along the shoreline. So obviously these create very different environments or facies when you have no sediment versus tons of sediment being delivered. So let's finish up this video with a quick look at biogenic sedimentary rocks. So these contrast with clastic rocks um, because they are usually made of shells, made of calcite, uh, and we're talking about things like limestone. So this isn't sediment delivered from the shore. This is, these are things that are actually growing and dying in the ocean. Okay, that's biogenic. So where do we see biogenic sediments forming? Mostly in what's called the photic zone. This is the part of the upper water column in which rays of light are able to penetrate. And biogenic sediments live in the photic zone because they are either photosynthetic organisms themselves that need light to live, or they may be organisms like crabs that are actually eating photosynthesizers. Long story short, if you want to have an ecosystem where organisms can live, those things flourish best in shallow water with a lot of sunlight. So that would be called the photic zone. And a corollary to that is that um, we don't find a lot of biogenic sediments in areas that are muddy. Uh, we find them instead in areas with a low sediment flux. And that's because muddy waters block out the sunlight and they preclude the ecosystems. So we usually find that biogenic sediments do best when it's, when it's not muddy, it's very sunlit. So we often see, a good example of this is uh, coral reef environments in tropical areas or arid areas like Australia. Um, so here's an example of a really extensive coral reef platform. Um, if you look under the water, it's made of these large coral heads that are part of this photosynthetic community. So all of this stuff is made of calcium carbonate or calcite and is eventually going to solidify into a limestone um, that is also made of calcite. Great, so in summary, we talked about biogenic versus clastic rocks. Then we looked at some of the properties of clastic rocks. We talked about sedimentary environments or facies and how they're controlled by water depth and sediment supply. And then we finished looking at the basics of biogenic sedimentary rocks like limestone. So I'll leave you with a couple concept questions, uh, a link to the quiz, and I'll see you shortly for the second video on sedimentary structures. Thanks.